Morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Danielle O'Gorman, and I am the Director of Debate at the United States Naval Academy. And today I am here to give you an elective about counterplan theory. So I would say this is a great elective for folks who are generally comfortable with the idea of counterplans, have maybe debated counterplans before, but are curious about ways to say the counterplan is illegitimate or curious about ways to defend their counterplans from other teams saying that. If you feel like you're maybe still a little bit uncomfortable with the concept of counterplans, I would encourage you to go back and review the lecture that I did that was an introduction to counterplans. Uh, and there's also a lecture that is sort of a more advanced uh, introduction to counterplans and a little bit more about counterplans on the topic. So with that said, um, I'm not going to talk about every type of counterplan today because that would be exhausting. Um, and in fact, even some of the counterplans on this list are probably fairly theoretically uh, legitimate, assuming the negative gets fiat, which we're going to go ahead and assume. Um, I think that to be is fairly settled. Uh, so the two kind of types of counterplan that we'll really talk about today are plan inclusive counterplans and um, agent counterplans. Uh, advantage counterplans are counterplans that do something different than the plan to attempt to solve one or more of the plan's advantages or harm scenarios. And uniqueness counterplans uh, are exist to give uniqueness boosts to an argue, to a disad that may not be um, unique. And so a great example of this is there are times in our nation's history where federalism has perhaps not been at its peak and the states have not had a lot of power. And so a counter plan might exist to have the courts rule in such a way um, that the states are able to, to sort of start with more power. And so that might be a uniqueness counter plan for the federalism DA. It might solve part of the app too, so it might function in different ways. Um, yeah. Uh, but today, for sort of types of counterplan that we'll have kind of some debates about whether or not they are theoretically legitimate or not, are picks and agents. And then um, we'll also discuss um, counterplan status. Um, so when people say in cross examination, what is the status of the counterplan, they're really trying to figure out if the counterplan should, it will appear in the 2NR, right? Um, or uh, even beyond that, if the judge, even if the counterplan does appear in the 2NR, if the judge can evaluate two different negative worlds in making their decision, both the world of the counterplan and the world of the status quo, or is the negative at some point stuck with a world? So there are three ways to talk about this. One is um, unconditional, and that means that the counterplan is the counterplan. The status quo is no longer an option um, for, the, for the negative. Uh, this counterplan will appear in the 2NR, or this critical alternative will appear in the 2NR. There's kind of a middle ground between conditional and unconditional, which is dispositional. Um, people explain what it means to be dispositional in lots of different ways. Um, the easiest way, I think, to conceive of it is that it treats the counterplan like a disad. So one, it means that if the... Um, affirmative reads both offense and defense against the counter plan, the negative needs to take the time to extend the defense to take out the offense. And if the affirmative straight turns the counter plan, if they only read offense against the counter plan, then the negative is stuck with it because they can't, you know, they can't kick it under similar to the way you would straight turn a disset. Nobody really says this anymore. Um, I guess it may still exist in some like pockets of um, so, like circuits that I'm just not familiar with, but um, I have not heard somebody articulate that a counter plan was dispositional in a long time. Um, so most people tend to say that their counter plans are conditional. Uh, bye. That only just means that you can kick the counter plan at um, at any time. Um, so there are some people who say that you can kick that, that sort of by the 2NR, 
the, um, the negative team has to make the choice as to whether they're going for the status quo or one of the counter plans that they read. There are also people who say that the negative can extend the counter plan in the 2NR um, and allow the judge to determine whether the status quo is the better option or the counter plan is the better option to win the debate after the 2AR. Um, that's still kind of a new-ish thing. Um, judge opinion on that varies dramatically. Um, and I think there are some interesting conditionality debates to be had on that question, right? Does the 2NR have to pick a world by their last speech? Sure. Uh, so uh, theory debates are really about um, two things, right? Uh, they're about fairness. Uh, is the debate balanced for both sides so that both sides would have the opportunity to win? Right, so that is a question. If you're talking about impacts like ground, fair division of ground, or limits that the affirmative, you know, can't do just about anything, or the negative can't, you know, go totally wild and read 15 counter plans, right? Um, those are kind of the uh, the core arguments of articulating fairness. And then the other impact um, is education. Right? And so here's where you might start to hear things like negative flexibility, right? And that means that we want um, new arguments to sort of be available so we learn new stuff. Um, and then uh, clash, right, the way arguments interact with each other, that is kind of the unique education that we get as, in debate, right? There are lots of things that we learn in debate that we could just learn if we like read a book, right? Or like did some research on the internet. Um, but the way that debate has sort of unique learning for us, right? People who talk about this say that um, we force arguments to interact with each other. So we force you to think about the argument, not just in a vacuum, but in the context of the other team's argument. And so you have to let your argument evolve in response to the other side, right? Um, and so if conditionality, for instance, or a pick, is really bad for clash because it makes it hard for the arguments to engage each other, then that is probably bad for our unique style of education. Um, so that's, you know, generally when you're talking about impacts to theory debates, you are talking about impacts that fall in one of these two categories. And sometimes they kind of merge the two categories. So first we'll talk about picks. Um, PICS is an abbreviation for plan inclusive counterplans. That means that the counterplan uh, does some of the affirmative, but not all of the affirmative. So they choose a piece of the, of the affirmative plan to exclude, right? Um, so if the plan does three things, the PIC might do two of those things. Um, I have some of the arguments sort of on both sides up on the screen. Um, Generally, right, people, people who make the argument that picks are good would say that the affirmative should defend the entirety of their plan. Um, that, you know, you don't, the, the negative sort of gets to test whether or not every single piece of the plan is a good idea. And so if it turns out that two thirds of the plan is a good idea and one third of the plan is a really bad idea, that's important sort of negative ground. Right, and then they would also say negative ground is everything that isn't the plan, and so this is not the plan because it's less than the plan, right? And so the test is, can we do less than the plan? And then this idea of testing again, right, is that it's, it's key to test the resolution, right? The question that we are being asked as debaters is, this thing that is proposed, is it a good idea or is it a bad idea? And it is educational to test that from a variety of angles. Right, and one of the angles to test it from is, does it do too much? Is it too big of a change to the status quo, right? Um, the other reason from an educational perspective why picks might be good is there's this distinction in debate between breadth, like a broad debate, which is about kind of a lot of different things, or depth, right, which um, kind of is a more focused debate. Um, and so people who say that picks are good would say that they um, focus the debate down to like one meaningful issue and let both teams get very, very intensively focused on that one particular question, right? So if 
the pick excludes like one, you know, part of the plan, the entire debate becomes about whether that one part of the plan is good or bad, right? And that that's good because it lets us sort of um, focus in on those things and learn a lot about that one small issue. And then finally, um, from an educational perspective, people who say picks are good say that they're the most real world option because generally we aren't just like, is an idea good or is it bad, right? We might say, you know, if the idea is to do three things and we might say, uh, three is too many, but two is just right, right? You don't say, should we do three things or should we do nothing? Right, and so that it's it's a most it's the most real world way of making decisions, which is good for us to learn because it helps us make decisions in, in real life. If we're policymakers, or if we're lawyers, or if we're doctors, or if we're just like everyday citizens going about our lives and making choices, um, that 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 is an important you know skill to add to our sort of like decision making box. Yeah, um, so people who say that picks are bad say that. Um, they steal or they moot the 1AC, right? Or, uh, you know, at least part of it, right? Because, um, you know, the, the first affirmative speech spends all of this time arguing that we should do a thing. And the negative says, yeah, like 80% of that. And so, you know, they steal the 1AC ground, right? Instead of generating their own independent office. And that's bad um, because, you know, we should have a more fair division of ground where the entire 1AC functions as a weapon against the negative, right? And then the other thing that they might say in sort of a fairness area is that um, the negative's job is to negate the whole plan, not just like 20% of the plan. And then from an educational perspective, they might say that they don't meaningfully test the affirmative because it's not just like, is the AF good or is the AF bad? It concedes that a large portion of the affirmative is probably good and only debates about a small part of it, which doesn't disprove that the AF is on whole a good idea. Um, and then uh, these folks would say, right, with this in this sort of like breadth depth debate that we're having, right, is that... Um, over-focus is bad for education, and instead, we should have broader debates that are about the entirety of the plan and plan action, because that's a better way for us to access lots of literature, right? So, um, imagine that if you, you know, if you read an AF and in almost every affirmative debate you heard kind of the same pick, um, you would really only get good at interrogating and, and defending that one part of the affirmative. You wouldn't develop skills around all of the other parts of the affirmative, and that would be bad for education. So that's kind of the picks debate set up right there. Uh, Agent counterplans are sometimes, you can kind of think of them as a subset of plan inclusive counterplans because they generally do the plan, but they have a different agent do the plan. Um, so uh, the arguments are actually fairly similar um, to the arguments that you would make about a pick. Um, the one thing that I do kind of want to highlight is that here, if you're going to say that agent counter plans are bad, you can make the argument that they're not real world because there's no literature out there that assumes the choice between like states and the president or Congress and the courts, right? Like it's very hard to find comparative literature because that's generally not how we... Like policymakers are not like, hmm, should we do this thing or should we tell all 50 states to act together in concert to do one thing? Which could also be another educational disadvantage to particular types of agent counter plans like um, the state's counter plan, for instance, is that they ask the agent to work in ways that that agent doesn't really do, right? Like the state's counter plan generally says that the 50 states have to like all do the same thing together all at once to like really attempt to solve the app. And that like the states don't do that, like see the COVID crisis, right? That they're all kind of doing different things and they're all over the map. Um, and so that's, you know, another thing to maybe note about, uh, about agent counter plans is that there's this sort of like extra objection on top of the, uh, the picks question, which is just that, that that's not really the way we make decisions. And so instead of 
um, being the most real world, it's actually not real world at all. That I can't say, um, you know, should I, uh, if, if the plan is I should buy a Prius, right? The counter plan can't be someone else should buy a Prius, right? Because that's not how, I can't just like mandate that somebody else um, do the plan, right? So there's nobody who could order one party or the other to do those things. So, uh, yeah. So now we can sort of talk about um, conditionality. Um, I really enjoy these debates. Um, I may be in a solid minority on that question. Um, but I find these debates very interesting. Um, all of these debates, right, all theory debates are really debates about what debate should look like and what the ideal debate round is for both the affirmative and the negative, right? So they present um, competing interpretations of how debate should function. Um, and to me, that's a really um, interesting uh, debate. So they are they're kind of like meta debates because they're debates about how debate should work. Uh, much like topicality debates or framework debates are. And so I find this particular part of that very, very interesting. Um, so people who say that conditionality is good say that it's key to check new affirmatives, right? That if a team is like, we're breaking new, we're not telling you what it is, right? You kind of have to have a lot of strategic flexibility in the 1NC so that the 2NR is set up to make good, you know, strategic decisions. Um, People who say conditionality is good also say that it's the negative's job to prove that the plan is a bad idea. That it's not like, and they can only pick one way, right? Like that's not what the negative's job is. The negative is to come up with as many ways, perhaps, that the plan is a bad idea, and maybe to finally pick one by the end of the debate, right? It's all, the negative's only job is to convince the judge that the plan is bad. Um, so those are your kind of like fairness impacts, right? That are about division of like ground. Um, the education arguments are that um, conditionality is key to negative flexibility, um, which means that the negative should get to be creative about the way that they negate uh, affirmatives and should be able to sort of come up with new strategic options and test them against affirmatives, um, and that that's key to sort of keeping negative arguments fresh throughout the entirety of a year-long topic. Um, and then folks would also say that this is the most real world, right? If I have an idea, right, and you say, I think that might be a bad idea, and here are three possible things we could do instead of that idea, I wouldn't tell you, you can only pick one, right? We would debate all three of them, and then as we kind of move towards a conclusion, you would maybe say, you're right, that other one isn't that good of an idea either, but this one's a really good idea, right? Um, if the question is, where should we get lunch, and I say McDonald's, and you say, um, what about Wendy's or Chick-fil-A or Burger King, right? I wouldn't say you have to just pick Wendy's and say Wendy's for the rest of the debate. Like, that's, no, that's not real world, right? They're, in the real world, we debate lots and lots of different potential options. Um, so people who say conditionality is bad um, say that it, forces shallow debating in the 2AC, right? That the affirmative kind of gets um, spread out of the debate, right? Because there are so many potential options, all of which claim to maybe solve all or part of the affirmative, that they can't figure out how to make strategic choices in the 2AC. And so they just say kind of the most shallow arguments and move on so that the debate never really creates um, depth. It's very, very broad to begin with. Um, that it's bad for clash because it's impossible to generate offense against these counterplans because if you turn it, they can just kick it, right? So you're not going to invest a lot of time in like putting together a well thought out um, offensive strategy against these counterplans because they can just kick them, right? You're not going to read three cards on a counterplan or four cards on a counterplan in an eight minute long 2AC if you know that it may not show up in the block. 
right? So, um, so the other thing that's bad about that is that it maybe forces, it pushes a lot of the clash in the debate to the rebuttals, right? Because the 2AC just has to be sort of like big and flexible because it's likely that the 2NC and 1 and R will kick some of the uh, competing advocacies. And, um, but that means then that the 1AR is really where the debate kind of starts to evolve. Uh, and you would like to see some of that clash happening like earlier, like in the two ACs, right? So, um, and then finally, they might say that it's bad for limits or ground because the affirmative can't predict the two and R, which means they can't effectively leverage the affirmative as a weapon against what they think two and R strategies will be. Uh, they just can't, you know, it's, it's bad for predictability because we don't know how we need to use the act. Um, and that would be supercharged in a world where there's tension between the conditional arguments. Um, so if there's like a K alternative that seems like it is dramatically in tension with the, um, with the counter plan, uh, then, you know, that's going to be even, even more troubling because we're, we're not sure what to say or how to answer this because we don't know which one is going to be more important. All of these arguments should have reasons why the judge should vote or what the judge should do with the argument as a response. Um, the affirmative would generally say that the negative has made the debate so unfair or like uneducational that they should lose. Um, and then the negative would say that kind of the worst case scenario for them is that they should not be able to go for the argument, right? Reject the argument, not the team. Um, that's kind of a hard argument to make unconditionality because the app's like, actually, that's our argument is that you can just reject the argument. Like reject the argument is a bad interpretation on conditionality. Um, most judges lean towards, uh, rejecting the team. If the affirmative team wins, that conditionality is bad, um, and rejecting the argument. So just like the counter plan goes away, um, for, uh, every other kind of like theory uh, impact um, or like theoretical objection to the counterplay. Um, yeah, I, affirmative team should still say reject the team because if the neg misses it, it's like whew, clean ballot, bye, um, maybe. So how to have theory to be right? Tips for theory debates. Everybody is going to read theory blocks in their 2AC. Everybody is going to answer them in the 2NC 1A, uh, 1NR. Um, maybe they will get extended throughout the debate, right? But there are ways if you want to start going for these arguments or if you are finding yourself as a negative team unsuccessful in answering these arguments, there are ways to make yourself a little bit more persuasive. Um, so uh, I have some tips on the screen. Uh, so the first one I have is slow down and don't be blippy, right? It's really easy to just be like, um, you know, read a three word description of all of your standards and then, you know, vote neg for fairness uh, and then move on. And that's really not going to be super persuasive. So I would say one, just for flowing purposes, right? Since there's no card attached to any of these arguments, um, you should slow down and have at least a little bit of an explanation about what your argument is in the 2AC um, and in the 2NC or 1NR. Um, and I would say as you sort of make the determination, like for the 1AR, if you are gonna go for this argument, um, you should, um, uh, you should give more explanation, right? So, uh, and, and what that's gonna look like is engaging the other side's arguments. So don't just read blocks at each other, right? Um, make sure that you are talking about the arguments that the other side is making. So always that's true, that's always good line by line debate, but I think in theory debates, people sort of forget that or they're not really sure how the arguments kind of indict each other or clash with each other. So their solution is to just read a general block and then just sort of like barf a bunch of like buzzwords at each other and you know see how it shakes out right and the side that doesn't do that 
is probably going to be the side that wins the debate, right? Um, this, the team, as always, that does the best explanation and the best impact comparison is going to win the debate. It's just that explanation and impact uh, comparison look, looks really different in a theory debate than it does in like a, a disad debate or a debate about the advantage. Um, the other thing that I would say is that if you, particularly if you are a team that wants to start going for like theory arguments against counterplans, so if you feel like that is a good kind of thing to have in the toolbox when you're affirmative, I would say make sure that you have uh, like not just good 2AC blocks, but also fairly well thought out 1AR blocks. Um, have multiple versions of the argument and then personalize it to the debate. So those are all um, really good things that you can do to make the argument more persuasive and engaging. Um, yeah, think about the argument. Treat it like any other argument in the debate. You would not just reread your disad shell in the 2NR and think that you're going to, you know, beat the other team on this DA. So why do that with a theory argument? Actually engage both your arguments and the other side's arguments. Do a little bit of comparison. Do a little bit of sort of hy hypothesizing about what debate looks like in your version of the world versus their version of the world. And tell me why that's good. That's all you have to do. So the next thing we're actually going to do uh, is we are going to have a um, mini debate between Hi hey everyone, we are back with a um, mini debate on conditionality between Kathleen Rock and Will Lewis, both from the United States Naval Academy. Obviously, I was able to sucker them into doing this because they're debaters. Um, and I will also be appearing to give the 1AR. So, um, I guess without further ado, here's uh, Kathleen with the 2AC. Conditionality is bad for fairness, allows the neg to avoid the best clash in the debate by spreading out the AF. It's also bad for education. Avoiding clash subverts the educational purpose of the debate. The impacts are supercharged. The fastest team would always win, which magnifies the disadvantages already inherent in debate. Reject the team. Rejecting the argument is silly in conditionality debates. It's like punishing someone convicted of attempted murder by executing their victim. Don't just kick the argument. It's giving them what they want. If they win, the conditionality is good, then we get to advocate perms. Give the 2NC answer. Conditionality is good. Counterinterpretation. We should be allowed two conditional advocacies. First, no abuse. The time trade-off is minimal. Second, key to education is it promotes in-depth education. Debate is about learning and fairness is a secondary consideration. As long as we are reasonably fair and we promote education from learning about more issues, the interpretation is good for debate. Three, we also promote education by letting the other team make decisions quickly and think on their feet and become smarter and better at debate. Four, rejecting additional arguments is bad for debate because it kills negative flexibility and locks us into going for DAs in case five. It's better for affirmative testing. Testing the affirmative through multiple different solvency, and solvency, um, solvency methods is better for education writ large. And five, reject the argument, not the team. There's still other issues to determine who the best team in the round is. Okay, I'm gonna give the uh, one AR. Extend the 2AC conditionality argument. A, it's bad for fairness. It allows the negative to avoid the best clash in the debate by spreading out the affirmative. B, it is bad for education. Avoiding clash subverts the educational purpose of the debate. C, the impacts are supercharged. The fastest team would always win, which magnifies the disadvantages already inherent in debate. D, you should reject the team. Rejecting the argument is silly in conditionality debates. As Kathleen said, it's like punishing someone convicted of attempted murder by executing their victim. Don't just kick the argument. It's giving them what they want. And if they win, the conditionality is good. We get to advocate permutations. That was not answered in the 2NC argument, which means that we get to advocate crimes all over the uh, flow. Uh, they 
say um, that there is no abuse. We would disagree. Uh, we say that the, uh, the uh, violation is that there's like multiple conditional worlds in the debate that we can't predict how to generate offense against, against those things. They say that they are key to education. We make the argument that our interpretation is better for education because it allows for depth in debate. They say that it is better to just like learn about a lot of different arguments, but that is not true. It is actually better to engage one argument and get a lot of depth in that argument that uh, is not possible under their interpretation because we subvert all of the actual debate in the round until at least the one AR, which A, makes my job impossible, and B, makes it really hard for us to generate any kind of clash in the two we see. It's all mooted because they can just kick all of the arguments without even answering them. They say, um, they say that, that uh, we need to reject the idea that, that can, uh, that like conditionality is bad because they are better at testing the affirmative. That is not true. That that their interpretation, uh, first of all, is not is not real world. The the, the senators and and Congress people are not going to present something unless they think it is good and, and won't drop it on the drop of a hat. And uh, our interpretation would still be a good test of the affirmative because they could make different different unconditional counterclaims and different unconditional advocacies in different debates. Guess what? We will debate each other more than once. There are going to be about eighty five debate rounds for individual teams over the course of the year. Maybe you should try reading different strategies in those and see what happens. They say reject the argument, but not the team. That doesn't make any sense in this debate because that is like executing somebody who, uh, like executing the victim of somebody who's convicted of, of, uh, of second, uh, like attempted attempted murder. That, that it gives them exactly what they want. They want the ability to say that, that those arguments don't matter. Make the arguments matter. That is our counter interpretation, which says that we should be able to advocate permutations. We are going to extend all of the permutations on all of the counterplan flows as a reason why the affirmative should win the debate. All right. Now yeah, give the two and our response. Our interpretation is best best for debate, which is just two conditional advocacy is incredibly reasonable. Even if we lose every reason why conditionality is good, you should reject the argument, not the team. We shouldn't lose. We're trying to level the playing field. They keep giving the same the, the same argument that you're just killing the person who's convicted of murder here. But this is just a rejection, not just a face value evaluation of the team versus our offense. One, it forces intelligent to uh, choices, which is better for education and stress testing. They must choose selectively providing a focus debate. Two, it's better for it, it's better for affirmative testing, which is necessary to solve different solvency mechanisms. This can be better the better response on the line by line but also three education outweighs all claims to fairness we won't remember whether we run this round we'll always retain the knowledge that we gained from it but now on the line by line first they say it's bad for fairness but we're saying that it's better for negative fairness here and key to negative ground other counter plan statuses allow the 2ac to run eight minutes of straight terms and they've advocated firms on multiple portions of this debate means that the specificity of the affirmative and the 1ac and the 2ac means that we get negative counter plans and second they said this education this was this work was done above we're necessary for different solvency mechanism they say they want more depth, but we're saying the counterplans are better for depth because we're able to test the solvency of the affirmative even better. They third argument here is that fast fast our team is always going to win. Our response is that fast debate is good debate, but also speed can't overcome the knowledge or educate uh, can't overcome whether or not a bad a team is badly debating here it means that even if the team is faster, it doesn't mean they're necessarily being the better debaters. Better debaters are always going to win at the end of the day. And four, they say they reject the team here, but counterplans are key to check against the permutations here, which means that you have to have some sort of uh, some sort of bulwark against permutations. Permutations and we're saying yes, reject team five. They said that we can't predict, but they should be ready to defend the affirmative here. They had unlimited prep time in order to get ready for the 1AC and the 2AC to be able to predict off pace arguments here. They say in six, it's again to just repeat of better for education here, but also counterpoints are, are key to affirmative testing in depth on solvency mechanisms. We're better for depth on solvency mechanisms. They say seven interpretation isn't real, but yes, we're real. Congress has multiple different legislative solutions to one specific problem here. It means that the, the negative by bringing up two conditional advocacies here means that we're having two better solutions to solving their problem by while avoiding the net benefit here. And they say, hey, different strategies, different rounds here. But yes, we're going to read different strategies in different rounds here. But why can't we just read multiple different strategies in this round here and gain education in this one out of the 85 round? Because every single one, every round matters in mind. They're extending their extensions of permutations across multiple different flows. Just more reasons why you should prefer to the multiple different counterplays here. They're just going to use, use the property when they have unlimited prep time. At the end of the day, reject, reject the argument, not the team. And there we go. Okay, um, I'm going to give the 2AR response.
conditionality is a stock issue and the first issue that you should evaluate in this debate extend our counter interpretation that uh, any conditional advocacies are bad for debate and all we have to do is win that conditionality is bad and then we get to advocate perms the violation is that their interpretation allows for three different conditional worlds in this debate and that makes it absolutely impossible to be af their model of debate is bad they say that uh, you should uh, uh, rely on like reasonability but reasonability is not a good interpretation in condo. It's not quantifiable and allows for judge intervention. And this encourages the logical strats and absolutely kills education. They say that um, a conditional world improves strategic thinking, but this is a turn because unconditionality increases the negatives strategic thinking by forcing them to come up with a coherent strategy prior to the one and C. It doesn't improve strategic thinking. It just forces the one ARs to have to go faster and faster and disadvantages one ARs who can't our impacts outweigh the increase in education from conditionality is dwarfed by the fairness internal link to education. They say that um, it's good to make debate harder, but this is not equitable. This makes the 2 streets, uh, 2 C strat decisions harder and 1AR to be faster, but gives the nagging multitude of options going into the 2NR and, and causes coverage issues, which makes the block easier. It kills uh, a negative education and only increases their win rate, and it's needed to preserve even education and switch side debate on the fairness impact. Conditionality is unfair because it isn't reciprocal. If we kick the plan tech, they shouldn't uh, be able to kick the counter plan. They say that we can kick advantages, but advantages are equivalent to are equivalent to net benefits. At the end of the debate, we can't sever out of the plan advocacy, and you should hold the negative to the same standard. They say that uh, conditional counter plans are key to negative flexibility, but this is question begging. You could easily develop a strategy that wasn't dependent on conditional counter plans. Whatever the impact negative flexibility is, it doesn't outweigh the education impacts we're going for and it allows for, mul uh, for multiple worlds in the 2NR with the status quo is, is always an option. They say that conditionality will increase uh, strategic thinking by forcing us to come up with strategic answers on the fly, but it doesn't improve strategic thinking. Thinking It just forces the 1ARs to go faster and disadvantages uh, uh, 1ARs who can't because they don't have 30 hours a week to practice and um, this is why our impacts outweigh extend our our 2AC voter remember the murder analogy they committed a theory crime by running conditional advocacy so if you find them guilty but drop the counter plan instead of the team it would be like finding someone guilty of attempted murder by punishing them by killing their victim it's it's just not fair and you shouldn't do it they say no in-round abuse means don't vote but that answers above on, on the education debate our prep and strat were skewed by the second they read it in, in into the debate, you should. Uh, if you don't drop the team, you at least drop the conditional argument to resolve uh, our educational claims uh, that were made above. Hey, thanks to both of you for coming in and doing that. I just want to point out really quickly for everybody watching uh, the video that Kathleen and Will both did um, a lot of the things that we talked about at the end. So they weren't just reading off of blocks, they were actually doing impact comparison on the line by line and engaging each other's arguments, which is super important. And they did a good job of talking about the impacts and what the worlds of debate look like under each of their interpretations and then saying why theirs is better. So it's the same kind of impact calculation and line by line debating that you would do on any other level of the, um, of the flow, you just, are doing it without cards and sort of in the like meta debate world of how debate should be. Um, so anyway, I hope you all enjoyed that and um, let me know if you've got any questions. <laughs>